So uh, we are talking about mobile today, and we're going to be trying to look at mobile from the perspective of the user. Um, the topic is the anatomy and habits of mobile users and why business um, should, uh, should take note. Um, we've got Nick Karolambos, who is um, a, a journalist by trade, but he ran kicking and screaming from print media into online media um, and has uh, been a, a really formative in, in this industry. He is the co-founder and CEO of MoTribe, which is a, a homegrown uh, mobile social network, which is doing amazing things. Um, and in fact, uh, Nick wasn't always the CEO. Originally, his title was Chief Ninja of Operations and Business Development. And I just wanted to explain that a little. Yeah, it was, it was it's a really funny thing, having left corporates and done corporates for most of our lives. Vincent and I wanted to completely screw with the model. Um, and we, at that point, were just two people. And I don't believe you can be the CEO of a company of two people. Like, that's just retarded. So we left that out, and um, we were just ninjas. And we've since dropped those, unfortunately, because outward-facing titles need to be slightly more formal at the moment. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of, we're trying to buck the trend of, of companies that are down the, right, down the line and normal and regular. We've got a fuck yeah board in our office where you can write whatever you want. And our first printed t-shirt said fuck yeah on them. So you know, we're trying to just be as different and out there and build the company we want. Um, and that's what we tried to do. Do you not actually train in ninjutsu? No, not, <laughs> no. Not, not a trained ninja. Just the the haircut sure. disagrees, but, you know. <laughs> um, and then we have Brett Sinclair. Brett has been involved in uh, mobile advertising and marketing for 15 years. He spent a decade overseas. Now he's back in South Africa, which is great for us. And he heads up mobile ad sales for Google. Um, and I'm Jason Zanopoulos. I'm the CEO of Native, which is a full-service uh, digital agency. And what we decided to uh, do today is to talk to you about mobile users from our three unique perspectives. So uh, Nick is going to talk to us about mobile from the platform perspective, the perspective of a platform owner, uh, Brett from the perspective of, um, of advertising, and myself uh, from the perspective of the agency. Um, I think um, when talking about uh, the perspective of an agency in any regard, one has to look at the changes that have taken place uh, in the marketing space. So over the past 50 years, marketing has been defined pretty much by brand advertising. And in brand advertising, the brand sits at the center of the universe. And so agencies have been accountable to the brand and to the marketer. But over the last 10 years, that's changed dramatically. The, the democratization of media, cheap audiovisual equipment, the access that everyone has um, to means of, of delivery like social networks has meant that the power has shifted from um, the marketer into the hands of the consumer. So brands are no longer owned by marketers, they are co-owned by consumers. And in that reality, the brand is no longer the center uh, of the universe. The consumer is the center of the universe. And as such, as agencies, we're no longer simply accountable to the marketer. We're no longer simply accountable to the brand. We're accountable to the consumer, to the end user. And when you look at mobile marketing from a consumer perspective, it looks very different than it does when you look at it from a marketer's perspective. So from a marketer's perspective, mobile is great. It's, you know, it's the most powerful and, and, and pervasive medium in the world. From a consumer, it's often an annoying waste of time. You know, you look at it from a brand's point of view, they go, wow, there are millions of these things. There's one in everyone's pocket. What a great way to broadcast my message. Well, from a consumer's perspective, I have a cell phone in my pocket to speak to my wife and my kids and my business colleagues, and I really don't want your billboard uh, being placed in my pocket. Um, and so that kind of traditional interruption marketing approach to mobile marketing is often relatively irrelevant. And you know, if we look at um, click-through rates, and we can talk about this uh, in the session, click-through click, click, click rates are, are tiny on, on mobile banners. They're tiny on web banners too. People don't click on banners. So you may say, well, the click-through rate on, on, you know, on online banners is 0.2 or 0.4%. It's even higher maybe on mobile. Whichever way you look at it, 99% of people don't click on banners, and, and statistically, that makes it pretty irrelevant. But you know what? Irrelevant is actually not too bad. Um, it gets worse than irrelevant. So marketers look at mobile phones, and they say, wow, you know, there, there are millions of, of, of SMSs moving between people every day. Let's try and, you know, surf that wave. So advertising on please call me's arise. Suddenly, I'm involved in a conversation with someone else, and a brand is interjecting, interrupting into that conversation, telling me something I don't want to know. That's worse than irrelevant. That's just downright intrusive. 
Um, and intrusive, and you know, you look at the click-through rates, and please call me, they're even lower than they are on banners. But intrusive isn't even the worst part of it. So I, you know, I get a, an SMS the other day, and my phone beeps, and I think, oh, maybe it's my wife to tell me, you know, my kids have just finished their school play. And I open it, and it's an SMS to say, hi, Jason, we've just opened a new pro golf shop at Canal Walk. <laughs> I've never played golf in my life. I hope I'm never going to play golf in my life. I don't know who this person is, but they're saying, hi, Jason. I, you know, have they not heard the statement, familiarity breeds contempt? For me, that is absolutely offensive. Um, don't come onto a personal intimate device and talk to me as if you are my <coughs> pal. There was that line in that old uh, martial arts movie, Bloodsport, where the one character calls the other character pal, and he turns around and he says, I ain't your pal, dickface. Well, that's what I wanted to say to, to the guys from, uh, from the pro golf shop. But of course, mobile can be used as a powerful marketing tool if you look at it from the perspective of the user. Um, and if you look at it from the perspective of the user and you say to yourself, how do I add value to these people's lives? The mobile device is in fact a device with which you can add tremendous value. So whether it be uh, you know, through, through providing a utility, and this is one that has been around for a number of years, many of you may have seen, was a brilliant little utility. It was called Sit and Squat. It was developed in New York City. If you needed a public toilet in your area and you wanted one that was clean, you could look on the map, see where all the public toilets are, and it rated them from great to terrible. So you knew if you could sit down or indeed you would have to squat. And that was sponsored by Charmin, and of course it was a great utility for consumers. You can add social functionality to, um, to a mobile network as well, as Nike's done in a number of instances. So this was Baller's network, which allowed you to schedule a game and invite other players to play an impromptu basketball match with you uh, in your neighborhood. Also a great utility. Um, but even more relevant to brands and just as relevant to consumers are the opportunities to start enhancing uh, the way people actually shop the way people actually interact with your product. So this was something that was done by Tesco, um, actually called Home Plus, although part of Tesco in Korea, where they allowed subway commuters to shop for groceries on their way home with the use of a mobile phone and a QR code, so that by the time they got home, their groceries um, were about to be delivered to them. And this kind of functionality can be taken in store as well, where you can enhance your consumer's uh, interaction with your brand, with your product, and actually add value to their lives. But utility isn't the only way to, to leverage mobile effectively. It's also a great entertainment device. And if you use it properly, you can deliver in incredible brand engagement and great uh, entertainment to consumers as well. The UEFA Champions League is watched by over a billion people worldwide, often on their own at home. We wanted to make their TV experience more like being a fan in the stands, more active, more social, more thrills. This is Heineken Star Player. Star Player gives you skin in every game. Prove your football instincts by responding live to critical match moments. Anticipate and react in real time as the game plays out, just like the teams on the pitch. Stay one step ahead of the action as you create a stake in every shot, corner, free kick or penalty. Dialing up the tension and getting right inside the game. So no matter who's playing, you'll have a reason to celebrate. Star Player is a world first. Exploiting the opportunities of dual screening and connecting viewers with their social network either via the Star Player iPhone app or the Facebook platform, allowing them to create leagues to compete with their friends and the world, choosing any fixture to play along live and, as the countdown begins, get in the game. Running in the background while you watch the match, football experts instantly send alerts for every Star Player moment, so every corner, free kick and penalty is an opportunity to score. And for those moments when even the greatest match is slow, there's the chance to prove your knowledge with Heineken bonus questions. If your instincts are sharp and you anticipate a goal is coming, hit the Goal Now button. If they score within 30 seconds, so do you. See how your score compares with your friends at any time in a match. Check how you stack up against the world. 
and earn rewards for a star performance. Finally, once the full-time whistle blows and the scores are in, share the glory and claim your bragging rights on Facebook. Star Player launched on the 26th of April for the first leg of the semi-finals and immediately set the football world alight. Changing the way football is watched forever and delivering a full 90 minutes of brand engagement per player, per game. Star Player kicks off again worldwide in September on multiple platforms for all 125 of next season's UEFA Champions League matches. This is football like never before. This is Heineken's Star Player. So great piece, uh, great use of mobile. Um, obviously very, uh, very pertinent for a European audience. And as Gareth said earlier, we need to be looking at ways um, to provide entertainment and utility to local audiences as well. Um, but I think regardless of what country you're in, regardless of who your target market is, the question you have to be asking yourself is, as Dan Pink would say, how do I add utility and significance to my offering? for consumers, because unless you're adding value, unless you're giving them utility and something that's relevant to your lives, you're simply interrupting a conversation that they're having with someone else. Um, so I'm now gonna pass on to Nick and let him talk to us about mobile from the platform perspective. Cool. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the tactics, opportunities in the platform, um, good or bad, um, and some experiences that we've had at MoTribe around the consumer, around our platform, and interactions with campaigns versus communities. Um, so I'm going to start off by what we experience as a standard mobile campaign. They're kind of crap. So right now the standard mobile campaign is a static page where you spend money to promote to users, you buy the users, you get them on the platform, you give something away and then you forget about them. And they disappear because it's a static page, um, they never come back and then you launch another campaign to the same users and you spend the same money buying the same users, getting them onto a new platform and those are the spikes. Um, and obviously the most active that the person is is the most recent interaction they're having with your brand when they click on the email, the SMS, or visit the Mobi sites. What we should be promoting, in our opinion, is community-activated uh, campaigns. So you launch the campaign, you recruit the users, you give them the tools on the platform that allows them to talk to one another, to chat with one another, to upload photos, to create user-generated content and interact with your brand. Um, and then you spend money reactivating them and engaging with them on the platform that you've already got instead of repurchasing that user to a new campaign and a new idea. So you can activate your campaigns inside of a community rather than creating a new landing page every single time you do this. Um, so something that we've identified in the users that is quite valuable to building communities. And I think at this point it's important to, to explain to you what MoTribe is and what we do as a company. Um, MoTribe is a platform that allows anyone to build their own mobile tribes. Um, and in, in brackets, that's community. A mobile tribe is a community, the way we promote it. That's the, um, I'm trying to bring this in, it's a tweet pitch, that's my Twitch. Um, <laughs> so use it, don't use it, whatever. <laughs> so some things that we've discovered. Um, if there is no common tie, the community is dead. And if you look at something like Facebook, it's really easy to pick out a common tie. I'm me, Nick Harrell-Ambus, and I've got friends who are them on their real names on this platform, and you know them. There's a real-world interaction. But on mobile, having worked at the grid uh, at Vodacom, we discovered that users didn't necessarily want to put their real names out there. They wanted to connect on a different level. They wanted a common interest that wasn't their name or their real location or their real social graph. So some things that we've discovered are age range, location, language, and the way that people are socialized. Those tie people together. A very good example of this was our very first community that we built ourselves, and it's, if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me talk about emo friends, and yes, that is with a W and a Z at the end, um, emo friends. This is a community for emo kids. Um, it's pretty big in the US and the UK, um, and if you don't know what an emo kid is, that's an emo kid. Um, it's a kid with very dark makeup, very dark hair, very emotional, and listens to a very specific type of music and dresses in a very specific kind of way. I personally hate this community because they are childish and completely irritating to no avail. However, they do present an interesting problem, and I'll get onto that in a couple of slides, but emos range from 13 years old to 24 years old. How do you deal with that in a community? You've got a 13-year-old and a 24-year-old. How do you protect those users? Those are some of the problems that these common identities do bring up. Another really, really amazing example, and one that I 
to this day cannot believe worked out. Vincent, um, one, the co-founder of MoTribe, said to me, these juggalos are awesome. And in case you don't know what a juggalo is, they are fans of a band called the Insane Clown Posse out of Detroit, a rap group um, who raps about some pretty offensive stuff. And their thing is they paint their faces like clowns. These are juggalos. And this is the Insane Clown Posse. Um, this network is such a great example of a unique appeal that these guys found. And there, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of them around the world. Don't fool yourself. It's not like there's 10 or 20 of these guys. They've got a gathering once a year where tens of thousands of people go to like their version of Opie Copy and paint their faces and get hammered all day. The most loving group of people you can ever imagine. And this site flies. We've done no moderation. We, they handle it themselves. It's just a really good example of a, a common identity that they share and how the network worked out really well. So here's the common identity threads that you can have a look at. Emo 13 to 20, ICP, the Insane Clown Party, 15 to 35. And another really amazing example, which um, we've worked very closely with Precult, who's doing really well at Tech for Africa <laughs> in the last couple of days. Um, Guinness VIP in Nigeria was an amazing case study for us in an African community that's registered close to 800,000 users in the space of 10 months. Um, it really is an amazing, amazing platform. And there, completely football-centric, and 18 to 35 was the age group. So you can see some trends that, that we follow. Some of the challenges, though, um, include dialects and languages. Are people speaking the same language or the same dialect? We picked this up as a problem in India, um, where different languages, different dialects of Hindi, different people are offended by different words, and we don't know because we don't speak Hindi. Um, age variations and sexual predators, like I mentioned, a 13-year-old talking to a 24-year-old, that's relatively problematic, and how do you deal with that? Um, content, and this is a very big one that I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about with Jason um, in the Q&As, but is, is the content supposed to be user-generated or brand-generated? And how do you balance the two? And on mobile, is the brand understanding that they can't pump out a five megabyte video because no one's going to download it because of the airtime costs? So these are things you need to think about around content. Moderation, does the brand moderate the community? Does the owner of the community moderate it? Or does the user moderate it? She's I hope I didn't say something wrong. People leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's like a comedian, right? You don't want to be in the front. Um, then gender, men versus women, massive, massive issue. If you only have 90% men in the community, women are not going to join. And if they do join, the men are going to make them leave because they're just going to want to date them. On mobile, the number one thing they want to do is date and shag, but dating also. <laughs> so you have to make sure to really try and balance the way that you're promoting your community in order to keep the balance there of men versus women. You don't want a community full of men unless you're targeting a female something, products, you know, whatever you can think of, and it's a targeted only females, then you can happily just promote it to females and have females visible, or men and have men visible. That's fine. Um, and then marketing channels. How are you getting the users to find your site? Above the line, below the line, mobile marketing, internet, whatever. There's a ton of different options. So we did a little bit of a graph. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can fail very easily. On mobile, it's very easy to fail. And a launch fail looks like the top. Your activity stays static and your users keep growing, you've got a problem. If your users keep static and your activity keeps static, you've got a problem. The way that you should have an engaged community is the new users come on consistently and the activity rates go up. That's how you should be thinking of this. If you compare that to a static mo mobile site, users come on, they do what they need and they leave and they never come back. With a community, you can gauge that success in activations and activity rates. So the launch window, it really sucks being the first anywhere, except if you're climbing Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. Being the first is awesome. Being the first on a social network is terrible. And that's what we're kind of asking people to do when we, they create their own communities and tribes on mobile. We're trying to say to them, own it, and then try and get the first person on there and get that person to stay. It's a virtual impossibility. What you need to do is get a lot of people on it at the same time or as close to the same time as possible so that you don't get bored. Imagine going into a bar and you're the only person there with no one to talk to but a lot of alcohol. Not so much fun. So it's the same thing with the brand. Imagine having all these prizes but no one to interact with. It's not going to work. So the users, as Jason actually picked up brilliantly, users are the center of this campaign. The users have to be the center of the tribe and the community, and then you can add on top of that later. But if you don't have the users, you don't have anything. Um, and the upside, I'm coming to the close. Um, the way that we look at community is you spend less and you increase your activity over time. And that's your savings, is as you grow, the community grows itself. They invite different users, you spend less money over a period of time, and hopefully the activity rate goes up. Sometimes it doesn't, and the community is just over, and that's the end of it. Sometimes it does. 
And so the last slide um, is around tools, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So integration. A lot of people are thinking that Facebook, Twitter, blogs, websites, and mobile are all separate things. And we firmly believe that that is completely the wrong approach. MoTribe has got Facebook Connect. As Facebook grows, we grow. Because people are interested in small niches. Facebook is your real identity. You don't necessarily want to tell people that you're an emo kid if your work is a banker. You want to have that environment separate. So you need to use all of these different things available to you to promote one platform. And I'm not saying that one platform has to be mobile or Facebook or whatever, but you pick it and you do it. Um, unified marketing. One of the reasons that the Guinness campaign worked exceptionally well in Nigeria is it was a unified marketing strategy. It had one end point, one start point, and one landing page, above the line, below the line, everywhere. It was all targeted at one space. They didn't segment the market. They didn't segment the message. It was one direct message, and it worked really, really well. Um, Something around the technology, you have to make sure that the stuff that you're doing on mobile is upwardly optimized. It's a phrase that we use to make sure that people understand that you optimize for the bottom in Africa, and then you optimize upwards. So you have to make things upwardly optimized. Now, I'm sure that you all have got very interesting questions around the iPhone and the smartphone and all that other bullshit that exists. But if we're talking about African problems and African solutions, fuck the iPhone. It's 1% of the market. Don't get me wrong. There's a space for it. If you're trying to sell an Audi, Get an iPhone app, that's great, I get that. But if you're looking for African-centric problems to African-centric solutions, it's the mobile web and it's the bottom end of the markets. So you have to make sure your product is upwardly optimized. Which means my next point is relevant too. Apps have to be in context. There is a reason that people build apps and there's very specific technology that app can do that web can't do. GPS location, for example. So if you're trying to do something in context and something specific, sure, Android apps, iPhone apps, BlackBerry apps, brilliant, I get that. But it's not for the mass market, it's not for the mass consumer. And the last thing that we at MoTribe focus on very heavily is one web to rule them all. We believe the mobile web is the future. You can optimize mobile web for various handsets. You can serve a smartphone application on mobile web to do what an app would do as a native app. So we believe that web is the way to go and web is going to rule them all in the future, whether it's with HTML5 or XHTML or whatever. But web is the one to rule them all. So stay classy. Hi, everybody. Let's also hope my presentation comes up. Is it straight after this, guys? Well, not really. They have to load it. There we go. So my name is Brett Sinclair. I look after mobile in Google. And what I want to do today is basically give you some insight into what is the consumer doing as the smartphone kind of evolves. Um, in the developed world, yeah, we're getting huge penetration across US, UK, um, all, over, all over Europe, but really is it starting to boom in Africa? Is it starting to happen in South Africa? Um, how is it going to be happening in South Africa and what's really driving this? And it's really all around price point. Um, so let's get into this and let's start having a look at what is this consumer doing and where they're going? What are they using these advanced connected technologies to evolve themselves as consumers? So we really see four trends at the moment. The first one's entertainment, and then immediacy, because the phone is in your pocket the whole time. Local, yes, the phone is in your pocket the whole time. And then a shopping companion. So if we have a look at the entertainment side of things, that's what drives innovation. You're not going to use a new device or a new piece of technology because there's this really fancy, cool accounting system. We're going to use it because we like to play Angry Birds. Anyone know Angry Birds? Show of hands. Not my wife? Good. It's a fantastic game where you take a bunch of Angry Birds and you flick it at a whole lot of pigs. Phenomenal. We spend 384 years of our lives every single day playing Angry Birds because it's fun. What took us by surprise was YouTube. 400 million views on YouTube on the mobile device every single day. Wow, does anyone know what the second largest video viewing platform in the world is? Does anyone know what the largest is? YouTube. Second largest? YouTube for mobile. <laughs> Crumbs. Um, so guys, when you've got spare moment, everyone wants to be entertained. You want to have fun. Now it's immediate. Because it's with you the whole time, what we're seeing is people starting to access the information via the internet, via the, the applications, 
when they have a thought. So let's go through an example. You're, you hear a radio ad, and the first thing you think is, damn, I'd like to actually find out a bit more about that. Or I've got to remember to book my hotel. And what we're seeing is more people are booking their hotel 24 hours before or on the day that they arrive in a city within, say, 30 kilometers via their mobile phones. We're becoming very immediate, and I guess the, the credit crunch was an indication that consumers are immediate. I don't want to save, I want it now. I'm not going to remember it tomorrow, but I'm going to do it now. So we're immediate beasts, and this technology in our handbags, in our pockets, are enabling us to do it right away. It's local, it's with us the whole time. You wake up in the morning, and what do you do? You lean over, you check your alarm, turn it off, and I'm quite sad, I check my email. My wife craps all over me, I get up, and then I start tweeting. So it's with me the whole time, so it's wherever I am. The contextual relevance, it's where am I at the moment. We've just released, or we're about to release on the 7th of November, a whole lot of smartphone demographic research, which is all accessed via the web and everything, and guess what? South Africa's included in this global research. So I decided to share a couple of stats out of that. And I was absolutely blown away when I looked at how many searches are happening on Google Mobile that have a localized intent. What does that mean? I'm looking for my nearest restaurant. I need a plumber to fix this problem. Where's the bank? Where's the closest ATM? I'm lost in Cape Town. Help me find the nearest pub, in my case. What was also interesting is that in South Africa already we're seeing smartphone users looking up a local business and actually calling them. Sometimes at Google we forget that the phone is not just an internet connected device, but hey, you can make a call too. So guys are like, oh great, let's call them. And 48% of those people who made a call went on to visit that business. Why? Because it was probably 50 meters away. So very powerful location, a huge trend that's happening at the moment. And because of immediacy, because it's fun, because it's local, it is becoming the ultimate shopping companion. So what we're seeing is, and a lot of retailers were stressing about these rich phones coming into the device because they'd say, like, they'll basically double check what's happening uh, or double check the price of a shirt or a bag, and then they'll go buy it online. Well, guess what? When you do that, what happens? In the US, you've got to wait 24 hours for that shirt or handbag to be delivered. In South Africa, you've got to wait 24 days. So the whole immediacy thing falls apart. So what people are actually doing is checking the product, checking recommendations, checking price points that might be cheaper maybe around the corner. Or maybe it's cheaper 50 k's away. In that fact, I'm actually going to buy it right here, right now. So the figures here, they're quite impressive, I think. 28% of the South African smartphone users are already checking products on their mobile phones. Now, as business, we do not make that very easy. Are there QR codes you can check it? Are your products online so people can compare? No. So 28% of the guys are really struggling to find this information. 26% uh, of them, that's a quarter of them, actually decided that I'm not going to buy this product, or I am going to buy this product purely because of the information they found on their smartphone. Compare that to the UK or US. UK and US, the corresponding figures are around about 26% use their phone, and 21% actually change their buying decision. So South Africans are getting quite advanced here. So what is really being accelerated? Oh, I forgot I squeezed the slide in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we keep on saying smartphones. How many South Africans are really using smartphones? I mean, for us in, in Google, our whole focus on Android is really one thing. We're not after the top 2%. That's for iPhone. Good luck. There's 98% of the world that needs a cheap, connected device that can allow them to compete, entertain, do everything they want that anybody else in this room is able to do. So that's what we're doing with it. We're bringing down that price point. 
So in South Africa, we're actually sitting closer to 43 million subscribers, active mobile subscribers at the moment. 15% of them are now smartphone users. Something with a touch screen, something with 3G device, something with a QWERTY keyboard, a Blackberry, a Nokia, an iPhone, an Android. So what does that mean? That means there's around about 6.7 million smartphone users, more than DSTV viewers. Wow. Gartner reckons by 2014, 80% of South Africans will have a smartphone. And it's not because we're all going to become phenomenally more wealthy. The smartphone is dropping. Next year, it's estimated to be at a $50 price for something the equivalent. In fact, there's a phone, the Adios, that's in the market that goes for $100. It has more features than an iPhone. Why? It comes with an FM radio. That's Africanized. Brilliant. And it's flying in Uganda, and it's flying in Kenya. And the same thing is going to happen. We're going to see a $50 rate next year. We're going to see a $25 rate in 2013. Now that figure is really starting to look achievable. So what's it looking like now? I mean, we have a lot of data looking at search queries. This is the growth, the quarterly growth that we're seeing from smartphone devices. It's already exceeded the amount of WAP queries. So what does Google define as smartphone and WAP? Smartphones actually anything with a real web browser. So uh, Android, iPhone, and the latest Blackberry, and some of the Nokias. Everything else is WAP. And we've already exceeded the amount of traffic coming from high-end phones. And look at the growth rate. It's phenomenal. It's not going to stop. It's going to keep on growing as data prices drop, handset prices drop, and people learn how to use these technologies by playing games, watching videos. Has anyone heard of Zmot? Awesome. I've always wanted to say Zmot on stage, so that's why I put this here. So, does anyone, so I'm going to give a bit of an explanation as to why mobile is accelerating Zmot. Zmot, sorry, I sound American. <laughs> Zmot, it's the zero moment of truth. So traditionally, we have stimuli, which is where you see TV ads and billboards on a new product. Say, let's take Duracell, a battery. And we see it, and we go, oh, it's a great Duracell bunny. Love it. I go to the store, and I have my first moment of truth, where I'm standing in front of an owl with 10,000 batteries, and I'm looking at this going, I've got to make up my mind which is the best battery for what I'm trying to do. I need to power my torch. So I'm looking on the back, and I'm trying to make a buying decision. I then I'm happy. I take that, and I go off to the store. I pay. I go home. It's a brilliant product, or it's a crap product. And that's my second moment of truth. That's where social starts kicking in, and I start telling people about this particular product. Now, what's zero moment of truth? And you can see why mobile is really accelerating it, because it's with you the whole time. You're doing research. You're trying to find out from peers of what the product's like. So before you get in store, you know exactly which TV you want, the model number, all the specs, all the plugs in the back. You go up to, um, I'm not going to mention a department store, but you go up to one of their sales guys, and they try to help you. You're like, leave me alone, dude. I know exactly what I want. I know the price point I want. And that's what I'm going to buy. So very, very powerful. And mobile is accelerating that even further. Thank you very much. So um, Nick, you, you spoke about the fact that um, the, the, the kind of the power of community as opposed to you know, a, static, a static page. Um, how do you reconcile the needs of a, a community like Emo Friends or, or Juggalo Family with the, with the needs of a brand? I mean, I, I completely get uh, you know, the power of creating these communities of common interest, but um, a community of common interest around a brand is more difficult. How do you reconcile these niche interest areas with, with a brand's needs? I think it's a great question, and um, in fact, I just finished writing down the sentence that a brand is not a common identity. Um, there are very, very few brands, and we can probably name them on our hands, and for me, one of them is Puma. That is a common identity for me. I am a Puma man. I wear Puma shoes. If you wear Puma shoes, I'll connect with you and say, man, I dig your Puma shoes. One of very few, right? 
ABSA, really great example. I'm in the hulling with them at the moment and I'm leaving them. They have no idea I'm leaving. You don't want to build a community around a brand like ABSA because you're in trouble. However, ABSA does a lot of CSI. They do a lot of sports sponsorships. Build the brand around the sponsorship and say, you know, the Vodacom, uh, the Bulls brought to you by ABSA or Vodacom brings you whoever to talk. That's where you build the brand um, and the community you have to find. And I think it is one of the challenges that agencies and marketers have got moving forward is find the common identity. People who drink a brandy, they, they, the common identity is not the brandy, but there is something that makes them all drink brandy. What is that? And I think that it's too easy to say, oh, we've got an amazing product. That's the solution. That's actually not the solution because amazing products are a dime a dozen just like a social network is a dime a dozen. What's unique about it? And it is now the onus is on the brand and the marketing agency to figure out what that unique appeal is. I think, I mean, I think, you know, Brett was what, you, you, sh you know, you're looking at these enormous uh, growth rates in, in things like smartphones and, and, and you know, shopper companion uh, devices. You know, following on from what, what Nick is saying, how, how do we get into a space and what are you seeing working where a brand is actually um, managing to put that device in the hands of a consumer. Because I think too often what we are seeing is brands thinking that they are a common interest, a sufficient common interest yeah. to bring people together. Um, are, are you seeing that being done successfully through, through the, the, the brands that you guys work with? Just to clarify, are you saying brands putting handsets? No, the, bra no brands, putting you, brands giving utility to consumers that are actually, because the, the problem is that, you know, everyone's looking at these numbers. Every brand looks at these numbers and says, wow, look, you know, it's amazing. I can, I can offer this growing community something around my brand, whether it's a utility or just, you know, a community. But most of the time, those things don't get any traction because mm. actually the brand itself is not mm. enough of a magnet. Cool. I mean, we see it the whole time, and I was just listening to your speech and watching Heineken put together this fantastic application. And a lot of times, we all come up with brilliant ideas on how to accelerate a brand's uh, engagement with an audience and what you could be doing to push product. But the one thing we see that gets missed the whole time is actually making it aware to the audience. So yeah, we talk about that this is the audience we'd like to engage with. But I'm, of course, I'm, I'm a very big fan of media. Uh, this is how we make money. And what people are doing on, say, these uh, handsets and smartphones is they're out there asking questions. They're, they're, for the first time, they're telling us exactly what they want. And there are millions of guys with millions of different um, demands, questions at certain times of day, at certain places of the day. So, or of the day of wherever you are. So it's really important as a brand when you've got these engagement apps or products that you're trying to build communities around to be there when the person is looking for it. So when they're doing a search, for instance, I'm now looking for football uh, games. Make sure that the brand's Heineken games are there so that they can start downloading and they're aware of it. So, I mean, I think that, you know, Nick, you also, you spoke about the fact that it's horrible to be the per first person on a social network. So let's talk about this, this, this media um, equation for a bit, because I mean, how do you get that, that critical mass, or even just that first group of people then, you know, to, to Brett's point, how do you let people know about it's, what you're It's bloody about? tough. I mean, it, let's be perfectly blunt about it. It's a very difficult thing, um, because the viral aspect of the world, it's just, it's a fallacy. Yeah. Um, and sure, every startup in the world can say, you know, we've got this viral coefficient that we're going to grow our social network. Bullshit. That's not going to work. That, Facebook did that, and now they've got 800 million users. They worked. One out of 100 million that off are, are, is working. And I think the truth of the matter is you need a marketing budget, you need a great message, and you need a good campaign through the line um, if you're a brand. And I'm specifically talking about brands. On MoTribe's side, um, we also do promote the end user building their own tribe. So if you've got a soccer team in a township and you get your 10 mates on there, how do you promote that to the people around you? Well, we're giving people the tools to do that. We're allowing them to post onto our portal and get some exposure and market their own thing inside of the mobile platform. So there are tools that allow you to do this, but you know, for our money, if you're a brand, spend money on marketing, mobile marketing. We use, Brett knows, we use AdMob and Google extensively to do a lot of our campaigns. But the reason that it's important is that it's very, very specific and calculable. You're not, it's not spray and pray. Um, and in fact, we're helping to 
make TV and radio ads more calculable too. With you promote a link, we track the link and see how successful that ad was. So there's a lot of ways that mobile is helping you to do this without just spray and pray and hope for the best. Because let me tell you, if you're hoping for the best, it's not gonna work. Your brand is not good enough to get 100,000 people to join and interact. The other thing that's um, to, to speak about Guinness is a great example and the Prey Cult agency did an amazing job of offering unique content that isn't available on any other platform. You can't get it on the Facebook group, you can't get it on the website, you get it on the mobile portal. And they did an amazing job getting the, uh, Roy Keane, I think, was in one of the chat rooms, speaking to the users in Nigeria on a chat room. That is phenomenal, they've never experienced anything like that. And in fact, one of the first FIFA sanctioned games in Nigeria happened because of this campaign, because of the great success. They got Argentina to play in Nigeria. That's how you win a campaign. Give them something they've never seen before. Um, you know, the brand recognition there is invaluable. Where do you want uh, to... Yeah, just on the point of TV uh, or radio, um, a lot of times if you're in the digital space, we kind of go, well, you can't measure it, you can't get a feeling on it. What is the impact this is having on my consumer? And what I love about the mobile device, because it's with you the whole time, whether you're on the go and you see a billboard ad or you're listening to radio, we actually see search spikes correlating exactly to when a radio ad was pitched for a certain set of terms. So a fantastic example is uh, FNB, uh, their gold cards. Uh, anyone listen to 702? My God, there's a lot of those ads. But it actually works. We see the search requests spike to the second when these radio ad campaigns are running. We also see it when you get home. Literally, instead of seeing a spike on usage, we actually see spikes between the TV shows wow. for certain types of ads, where guys are going, I actually quite like what this new brand has to offer. I'm gonna get online, and I'm going to find out more about it. They're not gonna remember, please SMS 321485-72S5Z, or go to something, 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 dot mobi, but they are gonna see your brand and go, what was that uh, Toyota brand, the new car Toyota? That's what they're looking for. They, they don't know exactly what your campaign is all about, but they do know a very kind of a subliminal message of kind of watching an ad briefly and something might have ticked, and then they want to engage. But what I find interesting is that all this traditional media and us as digital guys often discount it, but it's incredibly powerful. So as you're saying, through the line, is vital because you don't know where your audience is going to be and when they're going to be in that mode where they want to engage with whatever product you want and, to and put out. Are traditional marketers using that that data from you? I mean, are they are they are they tracking the search correlation to their uh, above the line? I think the only brand we've seen do it is F and B. Um, uh, F and B has been phenomenal around the digital space, and it started off literally a year ago where I think. They just wanted to test the concept, and they were so impressed. They literally are trying to track it as much as they can across. I mean, a brand could be running 120 different campaigns at any one stage. So it does become a logistical nightmare. So on their big in initiatives, they'll start trying to measure all their across the media, through the line campaigns. Well, I think, I mean, Nick mentioned it in his presentation as well, this notion of integration. And I think that, you know, for me, the, the power of mobile, and, and that Tesco example is a, is a great illustration of it, the power of mobile is not just in the device. It's in the way the device interacts with other often physical um, elements. So, you know, you can buy, you've been able to buy products online via Home Plus on your mobile phone for ages. But it's when they actually took those SKUs, those products, and printed them onto a wall in a subway that people started to buy them. And you know, the, their online shopping numbers rose dramatically. So I think too often we're looking at mobile versus traditional rather than mobile as the kind of magic yeah. device that unlocks your outdoor one. There's your a TV. couple of points that I want to jump on. The first is the nature of phone being always on. And I don't think that people are exploiting that as a concept enough. Sure. If you've got a TV ad, link it to mobile. People are sitting in front of the TV with their phones. If you've got a print ad, link it to mobile. No one reads a newspaper with a laptop because they do the same thing in some people's minds. But you read a newspaper with your phone. So link the two, make the two use one another and promote that, right? The second thing I wanted to mention, and this is kind of a dig at the agencies um, in general, but the data is available and it's trendy to have that data, but no one wants to use it yeah. because it's too hard. 
It's too much work for the agency to dig into that data and actually give their brand the best results. Because I promise you now, within a week of spending money, you know if it's working or not. And if it's not working, unfortunately, that means you have to go and repitch to the brand and say, look, this isn't working. We kind of screwed this up. No one wants to do that. So it's a very dangerous game playing with this data that's available. It should be the future to unlock everything. But it's a tricky thing to have. I mean, we, we know that we don't have brands using our data effectively. And we give drill down stats. Who's uploading photos when? Who's commenting on what from what area? What topic? What chat room? What message? We've got a boatload of stuff. No one's interested because it's but too much work. You've nailed it on the head. I think bad data is just as important as good data. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone wants to go in, and I understand as an agency, I used to own an agency myself, and you want to always go in with the best news possible. That campaign was rocking. But if you could go in and say, that campaign did okay, I'm not that impressed. This is where it went wrong, and this is how I'm going to make your brand even absolutely. more money. I think that's a very powerful statement. We don't always have to be on our A game when pushing product. We always want to be on an iterative, improving session. I mean, uh, innovation, so I just look at Google internally, uh, one of our internal mottos. You know, we encourage people to fail. Because yeah. if you are not failing, you are not innovating. The yeah. difference we have is do it bloody quickly. Yeah, it's, it's the minimum viable product idea, and brands need to start operating. I don't know if any of you know the concept of minimum viable products, but pick a product that you want to get out into the, the market and build it as quickly as you can with as much functionality as is viable in a short pace, space of time and see how the market responds. Brands need to start thinking a lot more like that. Pick a minimum viable product. Don't spend three, four hundred thousand rand building it. Spend fifty grand spending it, uh, building it. Spend fifty grand promoting it, and see if the market likes it. If they do, expand it. Yeah, I, th Go, I heard a know. great, uh, um, a great way of articulating that. It can. Uh, someone described it as the brand as futures trader. Um, and I think you know the days of planning something, executing and measuring it are over. Yeah. You now need to listen and respond. And so, iterate. You know, put a whole lot yeah. of bets out there, and when something gets traction. Jump on top Absolutely. of it. Um, just on from on, on the data points, I think one of the important things that you know that people have to get their heads around in terms of data is that actually data is useless on its own. Yeah. Insight is valuable. So you've got to be able to look at the data and extract an insight out of that data and then use that insight to optimize whatever you're doing. Just having reams of data is, you know, is pointless. But actually, so where does insight come from? So you before you even go into an area where you're trying to push product. You've got to know your key objectives. What are you trying to achieve? And then the data will be able to build inside off the back of that. So often guys go in with a, a very vague marketing pitch, but no real objectives that you can match back to data that then will establish that insight. I'm going back to a point that you just said around iteration. Um, you know, as uh, developers, as engineers, we ought to iterate and move very quickly. But think about the consumer. The consumer is always iterating. You know, the consumer doesn't go in and use a particular, say, app or mobile web or product or site. They go in and they'll start browsing around and spending time. Oh, it's not working that well. Oh, well, I'm going to keep on trying. Actually, I don't really like this, but hey, I'm still going to carry on visiting yeah. the site. They go, this is crap. Move on. I'll give you a good example. So if you're of that. not moving in yeah. that same sense that the consumer Absolutely. Is doing. And to make it more African centric, um, a big problem we've seen that people don't address effectively, and that's anyone, is data usage. Being in Africa, data usage is massive. How much airtime does it cost someone to download your app or to visit your page or to load that ad that you're trying to make money off of? Let me tell you, if your user goes on there, they check their airtime before they log onto your page. When they log onto your page, they check their airtime after, you log, after they log on. If it's too much, they never come back. End of story. Especially if you're trying to market to them and put an ad in there that's 10 kilobytes of download, You've lost them forever, and you've got one shot to get it right. And once you've got them, you can iterate quickly to make it more effective for them, but you've got one shot to get them. Um, Nick, earlier you, in your presentation, you spoke about content and, and Guinness in particular, and, and uh, um, you know, user-generated content versus um, kind of brand-generated content. When you're, when you're looking at a brand space like a Guinness community and you are inviting user-generated content, how do you build the brand purpose into that user-generated content? How do you create a space in which users are actually generating the content, but the brand remains? Uh, Interestingly, in the Guinness, um, there isn't that much user-generated content in terms of photos and blogs. It's mainly in the chat rooms. Um, and in that regard, you know, they get to say what they want to a point. And I think it's something 
for years, we've been harping on about transparency in web. Be transparent, be transparent. Yeah, there's a limit to that. In my opinion, you know, you own the community, you're the dictator, it's your site. If someone's saying something that is offensive to a group, offensive to a gender, get them off. Kick them off and let them go to align them with the brand's interests to a point. And I'm not saying you must get rid of anyone who says something bad about your brand. You must react to that. But, you know, there is a limit. Um, and I think that very clear parameters are important when you've got a community that you're building and you want content. And set them out, and we've done this in various communities of our own. Say to them, we want a photo of you writing something on your hand, and it must be this message. And if you don't get it right, you don't get entered into the competition. It's really that simple. And generally, we find that mobile users are very attentive. Again, because of the technology behind it, they are worried about airtime expenses. So if they get it wrong, they're gonna have to try it again. So if you set the parameters very clearly, then it'll work. The converse is also applied. If you don't set the parameters and then you punish someone, then your brand is in trouble, or you as the owner of the community are in trouble, because you haven't set the parameters effectively and you're not laying out the rules. So, you know, we found the mobile users are pretty responsive to, to the rules. So I want to uh, open, the, open the floor to questions. Just to kind of summarize, I think, what we've spoken about so far, um, the, the key issues with mobile, uh, Nick, as I think you really made the point when you spoke about uh, you know, a, a bank having a CSI project or whatever. It, you know, we need to move away from this notion of a brand positioning to a brand purpose. And that purpose needs to resonate with what is important to our, our communities. The second is that we shouldn't look at mobile as a standalone device. It's a device that must be integrated into the rest of the marketing mix, and it, it, can, it can really create exponential yeah. power. And third is, you know, is the data that's out there, leveraging that data, um, harnessing it, extracting insights, and, and using that to optimize what you're building. And finally, this issue of re relevance, understanding your consumer, understanding what's important to them, whether it be the cost of data usage or, or just what they need, and, and you know, in, and making sure you um, take cognizance of that. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Yeah. I, I promise, Brett, I'll ask at least one question. Um, this is actually quite serious. We've done a lot of TV-based activations um, to engage on mobile. And what we see is a 30-second flight at ad just doesn't have enough exposure to get people onto mobile. Have you guys got any ideas about that? Because, I mean, obviously with idols, there's this two-hour show and this tons of time to get the users engaged, but in a 30-second flight to TV ad, is there any way to get people actually onto mobile? I mean, that, that's exactly what I'm saying, is a lot of times, it, the 30-second pitch, actually the mobile element is the last two seconds, where we put up some details, whether you want to go onto the web, whether you want to SMS, whether you want to go to a mobile site, please contact us on Facebook, Twitter it, I mean, we completely overload them in two seconds. So what we're seeing in the search element is the consumer is engaging, but they're going to the search query. They're asking their phones, help me, I saw something about something that was interesting. So um, I strongly suggest looking at this huge amount of volume of data that's coming off search queries and be there and own the space because no one else is owning that space in search, whether it's SEO or SEM. But listen, that's a long, you're talking a long-term process there, right? You need the brand to go in and say, we want to target this in six months. Let's build up the SEO, let's rank in the top 10. If so that when SEO. they do search on the TV and they see it, like that's pretty intense, right? Well, especially if you're doing, well, it's fine if you're building your brand, say from a Toyota point of view. So doing brand terms, fine. But if you've got a campaign specific thing, so you say more paid marketing. Then look paid at page. Okay, fine, I got you, I got you. But, uh, I mean, oh, no, go for it, go for it. No, I mean, I think, I think the other thing is, you know, it, it's the same principle as tagging on to anything. Tagging on doesn't work. So if you've got a TV commercial that has nothing to do, that, that isn't sent, it doesn't have an idea in it, that has some kind of mobile application related to it, and you're simply putting a Moby site address at the end of it or a URL at the end of it, the likelihood is that people are not going to respond. But if that 30-second ad contains something that you actually need to go online to understand better or get more value out of, then you're much more likely to drive people to that place. But simply putting a URL at the end of an, you know, an, an emotive brand ad, you know, I've kind of I've seen the ad. Not only did I not want to see the ad, I certainly don't want to go and look for more information. About I think there's also there's two things you need to ask when it comes to TV in relation to other stuff. Firstly, what's the outcome that you're looking for? 
Are you looking to get the consumer to visit the site and register, or you're getting them to buy something? So once you figure that out, then you've got to figure out what is the destination you want to market. If it is the mobile site, then you have to think about the user experience, and that's not a QR code, let me tell you right now. On a TV, on a TV 30 second ad, by the time the person's figured out what a QR code is, downloaded the app to read the QR code, then forget it. It's SMS shortcodes. That's the way that this works. It's not URLs, because I guarantee you, if you ask your mom or your sister or your domestic worker what the word URL is, they won't have a clue. So it's not about the URL either. It's about an SMS shortcode with an action that leads to something. And what is that unique offering? Are you offering them to visit your mobile page because it's the same as Facebook? That's nothing. What, what's unique that you're offering that user? And it's got to be about unique content. And I mean, you've got to drive someone to something that is unique. Offering the same shit all the time, just it's irrelevant. Okay, so, another question. Quick, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to see a bit more from the brands. The guys that we, you showcased really went further than just saying, I have a mobile presence, or I can Absolutely. do something with mobile. They actually changed their business, like Tesco's. They didn't have enough store space. They couldn't compete against their competitors. So they rolled out these billboards in every single train station in Korea. Suddenly, they had this massive footprint. So they're actually using mobile beyond just brand awareness. They're actually adopting it into their business. Why? Because their consumer's mobile. The consumer has it with them every day. And uh, trust me, we can go through a million examples. Every brand could have a reason from a car company using location-based navigation services for their cars. Brilliant. To, to, to Heineken, where you can play games and engage with the league that they're sponsoring. So, change your business to adapt to the consumer. Don't just put a presence out there. Absolutely. Your consumer's mobile. Any more questions? Yeah, I've got a question here. I, mean, I posted what you said earlier on Twitter, Brett, about the search results you get on 702. But what doesn't make sense, maybe you can explain it, is why if you hear an advert on 702 about FNB, you go and you Google FNB instead of going directly to FNB? Um, so basically what the guys are doing is it's the usage of the phone. So what we're seeing is instead of opening up your browser, trying to remember what FMB's long code is, they basically are doing a search straight away. They're clicking on a search icon, asking a question, and finding the result. Now the problem with FMB in the beginning is they weren't being found. So a lot of the traffic was going to other competitors. But I mean, what it proves, I mean, what I love about it is that the radio medium is incredibly powerful and it's instant. And I've always, we've, uh, for the last 15 years, we've seen this close correlation between the radio listener and the mobile subscriber. They're very much doing a similar kind of engagement, a very personal, a very relevant engagement. So it would be interesting to see more of it happening together. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's exactly like we've got this audience in South Africa that are looking for product on their phones. A quarter of them are looking for product. Where is the South African business? A lot of times, I mean, they'll browse. They'll flick through a lot of search queries to find it. And that's madness. You know, we're all talking about we want to be there. You know, I hope we get found. Why? How come we can't do it? It's so difficult. Are we mad? The consumer's out there desperately trying to find us. And there is this disconnect between the mobile consumer and how they're using technology and business who's going, yeah, I'm not really there yet. Uh, I don't believe that the consumer is there, even though they're a consumer themselves. So we've really got to catch up. And I love what the companies like FMB who have completely adopted technology as one of their main strategies to engage, to offer services, to sell products. Brilliant. I've got a great personal story on that. Mm. I left ABSA. About a week ago, I tweeted RB Jacobs, if you can get me an FMB account in two hours, you've got all my business. Two hours later, I had a premium account, a premium bank, and my account set up with online banking. Wow. Done. That's how FMB is winning this game. And I mean, that's taking market, utilities, taking their medium to the markets. It's brilliant. Great story. Gareth? Yeah, quick question for you guys. Um, so I've done a lot of SEO stuff in, in the last few years, and I think that what people don't seem to get here is that the conversion rate from searching through to actually getting that action, whatever it may be, is, is directly relational to your landing pages and how stuff works. So for Brett, can you unpack how A, businesses get access to the data that gives them enough 
information to make the decisions that they should have been making two years ago, mm. and then B, how important it is to create that experience on the back end of that search so that when they actually start doing stuff, it actually works. Because I think the execution yeah. of that in South Africa and Africa in general cool. sucks. Terrible. And it, it's terrible. So like, how do we change that and how do we give enough data to businesses for them to actually go, wow, shit, there's this internet thing and actually it's quite big. Okay, so, <laughs> exactly. So I mean, there's, so around the internet, there's three kind of states as a digital marketer, if you're trying to engage with an audience. The first state sits in the middle, which is all about the click. So in South Africa, we're fascinated around the click. I see an ad or I see a search result, someone clicks on it. Let's make sure the message is relevant and I'm more interested in my click-through rate. How many times was this ad seen? I'm fascinated over that. Fail. The next, the most important step is actually afterwards. So I've now clicked on that. I'm now engaging. Now how am I engaging? So we provide a whole lot of tools around analytics. We also provide a whole lot of conversion analytics uh, tools that sit off the back of that click. So when you click on it, you know exactly where the person's gone, how they're engaging, and you can start working on that experience. And you start realizing that just a click isn't just going to drive conversions and products. You know, you could be running something like, I mean, you've got, there are a lot of guys on the internet who also run some scams. So they'll run like iPhone scams. You want an iPhone, click here. Into your telephone number and poof, suddenly you're getting hit by subscription services. That's not very relevant. Whereas um, if we had measured it to the point where we're offering iPhone and it is actually iPhone and is taking you to an iPhone landing page and you are able to then take that person through the experience and the experience is one of two things. As a consumer, what are we doing when we're looking for things? I'm trying to educate myself, I'm doing ZMOT. I'm trying to find out more information whether that product is the best product for my needs, whether it's price, whether it's feature, whether it's functionality. That's one of the reasons why we're there. We then are, if we are sold and we're ready to go, then we need an easy access point to then click and buy the product, or get it delivered to us, or pay for it. So we need all those mechanisms sitting there to engage. Now we can start measuring all of that. In fact, the next important part is the pre-click. And this is where the rest of the world is. Because pre-click is actually phenomenally important. That's your stimuli. So that's when I see an ad um, for the first time, say it is Heineken, and I kind of think to myself, mm, I've seen the ad sublimely, I'm not really taking much sense of it. I then do a search query, and I find some result, I educate myself, but I'm not yet convinced. I carry on browsing, I'm still not that convinced, I see a couple of ads, but the ad now changes, because we know that you've seen that ad, we know you've done an informational search, we know the next ad should maybe be, it's like a sales pitch, if you're a salesperson, you engage with them and you try close them to the point where they'll buy it. So the next ad could be something like, um, get 15% off this product. Are they interested? Great, I am interested, click on it, and then there's engagement. So what the pre-click does, it is actually getting you more verified leads to the point where they click, and if it's a verified lead, it's going to go to the point where conversion happens at a much better rate. Gareth, are you, are you, is your question about the, the user journey or is it more about the SEO that gets you to the top of that I, search I, result? I think the user journey in this context is... I, I think I have, I have a, good, a good example. So we actually do use Google's conversion tool very effectively. We put it inside of our login and we tracked it over a period of time. So we can then track a campaign from advert to registration into our page and see what the user does thereafter. However, that's not where it ends. Unfortunately, the tools didn't exist for us to continue that process, so we built them ourselves. So we've now not only got Google, we've also got A-B testing on our platform, where we can test everything that the user's doing on either platform, pick the one, see where they go through, and then we track them all the way in. We give them points for all various stuff that they do. But I don't believe it's being done effectively enough here. People just spray and pray, again, with a spray and pray, even on web. Just put up a landing page and see if it works. 
test it. Test it against something else. See if it converts. And then just a quick interesting little snippet on click-through rates and, uh, and clicks. In general, we've, we found some really amazing stuff around discovery of your site. So we couldn't understand why our clicks were becoming more expensive over a campaign of about two months. We then realized that it was because the users were using those ads to rediscover the site. So we weren't getting conversions, but we were getting clicks, because we get one conversion and then ad was getting clicked seven or eight times, because that user was going back to the site that they found the ad, refining the ad, re-clicking it. So the conversions were going down, the clicks were going up, the expenses were going up, so we had to pull the ads. So it's not just about the click, and Brett could no. not be more right. More important is the conversion, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and then you're thinking, why? So, yeah, there you but go. that's where it's important to keep your, your, your messaging and your campaign Fresh, correct. Fresh, absolutely. So we, we see something called CTR degradation. And what that basically is, if someone's seen you ad once, and they haven't clicked on it twice, they haven't clicked on it, the chances of clicking on it, the click-through rate just plummets gone, through yeah. the floor. When that starts happening, fresh, criteria, uh, fresh creative, fresh messaging, fresh uh, campaigns. You know, we, we're human beings. We like new things. We like to see... Uh, new trends, new products. We don't want to see the same old, stale, bored stuff. That's where we zone out. So we're going to take one more question and then wrap up. I think just just one thing we have to add to this. We've spoken a lot about uh, we've spoken a lot about clicks and we've spoken a lot about um, funnels. But uh, you know, let's not forget that we are now um, exist within a social space, and people don't only find stuff by searching for it; they discover it through yep. um, friends and strangers, and um, and through a process of, of of social propagation. So our funnel that traditionally went like this needs to flip onto its head into a, a megaphone and you yeah. need to am amplify those messages as well. Uh, thanks. Um, Brett, if I could just pose a question to you. Um, South Africa has seen uh, the promulgation of some legislation that affects direct marketing uh, of late uh, Consumer Protection yeah. Act. We've got uh, things like the um, protection of personal information yeah. uh, coming through. What's the readiness of, one, our legislation for this emerging tech stuff, and to the readiness of business to comply with that legislation, and also, probably more importantly, to comply with consumers' expectations. So readiness. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, congratulations to the DTI on the CPA. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, they had to find a fine balance between protecting the consumer, but at the same time, not disrupt some really massive uh, business opportunities or existing businesses that are making a lot of cash, but that might be the only way to kind of market. So they found this interesting balance, and it might not be exactly what I believe in. I'm, I'm a, a, a co-chairman of the Mobile Marketing Association, so we believe in opt-in. Um, and, and the CPA still allows an opt-out. So the theory is, is that you can still market to these guys as long as you've checked a central database to make sure that this person hasn't opted out already. However, getting it ready, the cons the, the, we haven't as an organ or as an industry gotten the databases ready, the opt-out databases. So you will notice a lot of guys are still spamming the hell out of us. There's no way as a consumer to kind of opt out of these things. From a business point of view, if you are sending spam, you're doing more damage. So a lot of the guys are saying, well, I love sending SMSs to phones because I get a response rate of 2 3%. Isn't that phenomenal? OK. How irritated are the other 97% that are not responding to you and wanting to rip your heads off? How good is that for your brand? So I think a lot of the businesses need to start being aware that, yes, it's really easy to buy a database and just market, but it's not doing any good to your brand and to the products that you're trying to drive. Regulation is also trying to protect the consumer, but I don't think we're quite there yet. We need to build out the databases. We need to put in the, the uh, fines and regulations to actually punish the guys who are not checking to see if you've opted out. And I believe that's literally months away. And, and then, Poppy, that's interesting. I think we've got a lot of revisions to do there. And I still think um, it might be a little bit behind on what technology is doing. You know, wh where is the personal information stored? How is that managed? It is vital. And at Google, we, we like to champion personal protection of information. 
Um, and, and we definitely want to see that as a main driver in South Africa. But I think we need to look at what technology is doing and how best to do that. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, so I think, I think in closing, everything we've spoken about today is that the consumers at the center don't ask how, what, you, what mobile can do for your brand. Ask what mobile can do for your customer. That's awesome stuff. Thank you very much to Jason, to Nick, and to Brett. Only, the, only, the only negative thing that seemed to have come out of this session is somebody criticized the shoes that you guys are wearing, which I think was... But seriously? Yeah, they I said, saw that. They well, said they're not cool. That's really uncalled for, you know. Definitely maybe it was not the flowers on, Maybe it's the flowers on Jason's shoes. Eh?